All right, so the book is about leaders are made here. We've got leaders that are listening and watching us, Mark, and they're going, oh, I need this. But Mark, if I'm honest, I don't know where to start. I, I know I need to develop leaders. I, I, I know I need to look for potential leaders. How do I get started? Well, the good news is there is a starting point. Yeah. But I want to tell you, if you miss the first step, you don't even need to do the others. I mean, right. there is a starting place to create a leadership culture. So thank you for asking that question. It, it's the question I answer most often. Mm. And you have to have a point of view on leadership. Now, let me, let me take that a step further. You have to have a working definition yes. for your organization. Because here's what I know. If you passed out three by five cards in any organization in America and said, write down a definition of leadership. Virtually everyone in the American workplace could write down a definition. I also know that unless an organization has done the hard work to forge a consensus, and I use that word uh, intentionally, think of the metaphor of forging, right? The hard work, the, the pounding it out of saying, here's our definition of leadership. If you haven't done that, everybody's gonna have a different definition. Well, that's where we found ourselves 20 years ago. We were having trouble accelerating leadership development and, and in part because everybody defined leadership differently. Mm. So you can imagine some of the unintended consequences if you've got, let's just take your senior leaders as a case study. You've got six or eight senior leaders and we lived through this and they had different working definitions. Wow. Well, it affects, it affects who you recruit, who you select, who you, you know, who you, uh, how you train, who you recognize, who you reward. We had situations where one department had a leader, another department had a, a shortage, needed a leader, and they wouldn't let them transfer because they didn't think they had a leadership bone in their body. Mm. Like, well, how does that happen? Well, because they had a fundamentally different definition of leadership. And of course, there's a long list of unintended negative consequences if you don't agree, right? Mm. And so we were living that. And so we stumbled upon the, the revelation that we have got to have a common, agreed upon working definition of leadership if we have any hopes of creating a leadership culture. How painful was that process of collectively going, all right, we, we've got to sit down and go, for Chick-fil-A, this mm -hmm. is how we define leadership. Because I know people are going, all right, that's probably, that's probably us, if we're honest. Right. Is that right. a painful process? And if it is painful, is it worth it? I think I know the answer to that. Okay. Painful might not be the way I would describe it. Uh, challenging, mm -hmm. arduous, uh, time-consuming, but you have, I mean, is it necessary only if you want to create a leadership culture, yes. only if you want to accelerate leadership development, only if you want to deal with that l lengthy list of, of negative consequences. I mean, we discovered there at the time, this was 20 years ago, there were over 6,000 published definitions of leadership. Wow. So who knows how many there are today? And so it, it is to be expected that people are going to have different working definitions, different, sometimes different paradigms around what leadership is. And mm. so you, you actually have to do that work. Now, in our case, it took a while, in part because we sell chicken, right? This was not, this was not in our sweet spot, but we knew we had to do it. So I put together a team of really smart people and said, OK, we get to figure out what's our point of view. Mm. And we did all the stuff you would expect. We did benchmarking. We did interviews. We read a couple hundred books on leadership. We're trying to figure out, OK, what is it that we believe? Now, the last thing I'll say about that, is it painful? Um, it requires leaders at multiple levels, but particularly senior leaders to think of the greater good. Yes. So I'll give you a quick story. Um, when we were doing our very first training session, this is after we had done the work that I just described. And our executive committee knew that we were going to do this. This It's really more of an orientation for some of our new leaders. And we were going to share our point of view. And they said, we're going to send somebody in from the executive committee to encourage the group over lunch. And I'm going fantastic. 
So we have a member of our executive committee show up. They had been unable to attend the morning session, but they knew what we had been talking about. And so this gentleman stood up and says, I understand that you've been learning about the serve model this morning. And, you know, I'm thinking at least he knows what we were doing this morning. That's all good. And he said, I just want you to know that if you survey the members of the executive committee, we do not all agree that that's the best definition of leadership. And of course, my heart just <laughs> stopped. Right. And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm, I can't imagine how I'm going to try to fix this. But thankfully, that was a comma, not a period. Maybe it was a semicolon. He said, however, even though some of us prefer John Maxwell's point of view and some of us prefer, prefer Andy Stanley's point of view, and you know, he named several other leadership thinkers, we decided that it would be best for the organization to adopt one point of view and what you've heard this morning is that point of view. Mm. So he even acknowledged the diplomacy, the statesmanship, if you will, that senior leaders had to say, you know, I may have a way that I like to talk about vision that's different than this. Or I may, I may think, you know, this is an important piece or element. But for the greater good, if we're going to get this organization aligned, we're going to come together around a common language and a common point of view. And so we made that decision almost 20 years ago, and we've been in deployment mode ever since. Mm. Boy, that is so good. All right, now you kind of tease us. There's so many steps. I'm going to turn you loose. Do you want to roll through okay. some of those and just give well, us- Well, I'll do it really quick. Yeah, I'll do it really it. quick because we realize that as critical and as essential as, as having a leadership point of view is, that working definition, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So we began to strategize, what do you need to do? And, and here was maybe the insight, and then I'll quickly run through the steps for you. There is something that every organization needs more than leadership. They need a leadership culture. Mm. And here's my working definition. They need a place that routinely and systematically raises up leaders and creates a surplus. Mm. See, the surplus is the, is the indicator that your process is actually working. This is how you build the bench. This is when you have that problem to be solved or that opportunity to be seized. You've got another leader ready. Mm. And we said, OK, if we're going to do that, we need more than a definition. We do need a definition. We need to know what it is we're trying to build. What is it we're trying to create? We're trying to create leaders who can do these things. And we said, what do we need to do? Well, the second part of this journey is that you have to teach it. You have to teach it and the skills that are required to execute against it. I can tell you that one thing you need to do as a leader is engage people. And in fact, that's in our definition. That doesn't mean you know how to do that. In fact, most people would look at that and go, huh, what does that mean? Or they would say, yes, but how? We think yes, but how is the most common asked question in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, but how? And so, so not only do you have to define it, you have to define leadership, you've got to teach it. And that all forms, all fashions, mentoring, formal, informal classes, resources, you know, books, videos, I mean, everything you can imagine. How are you going to teach it? And how are you going to teach it at various levels? Um, you just have to help people go beyond, I know what it is, to, okay, I think I know how to do it now. Mm, yeah. All right, so we've got define it, teach it. What's next? Next, you actually have to practice it. The research on this is staggering. And we didn't do this research, but it's out there. You Google it. It's all over the, the Internet. And I'd heard it at conferences. Even when I was in the training function, I had heard this over and over and over again. If you survey leaders on how they learned to lead, there are multiple inputs. But about 70 percent of a leader's uh, competence, they attribute to actually leading. Mm hmm. They still need the knowledge. They still need the training. They, you know, they still need something. They, they got to know what to do, but they learn it by their own admission when they actually lead. So just a quick example of that. Uh, you can use a baseball analogy. If you're the manager and you have the opportunity late in the game to put in a pinch hitter and you look at your bench and you've got a 300 hitter and a 100 hitter, 
there are a lot of situations when you're going to put in the 300 hitter. And sometimes that is absolutely appropriate. But there may be times when you want to put in the 100 hitter to give him the opportunity, to give him the experience, to help him feel the pressure, to display your confidence in him because you're going to need him later in the season. And what we found is our natural tendency, and I think this is true of leaders almost universally, when we have a problem to be solved or an opportunity to be seized, we tend to put the best leader we've got on it. But that doesn't help younger emerging leaders, developing leaders, that doesn't help them practice. That doesn't help them uh, get in the game. Uh, one, one example of that, we were in a meeting, this was a, a while back, we had a, an opportunity that we needed to seize and we, somebody jumped up to the flip chart and they said, who could lead this? And after they wrote six names, I said, time out. I said, none of those are younger leaders. None of those are emerging leaders. Those are all leaders who we know could do this with three hands tied behind their back. You know, it, it, this is not a stretch. It's not a challenge. It's not developmental. I said, are there any leaders that need this opportunity to grow and to develop and to practice their leadership? And we ended up giving it to someone who had actually never led a team before mm -hmm. because we believed in that person's potential. So sometimes you're going to put your big dog leaders on those big problems and big opportunities. And I understand that completely. We're just trying to develop the discipline of hitting the pause button and saying, is this problem or opportunity a situation where we could have a leader practice mm. what they're going to need to develop over time? Yeah. And that to me is so important, Mark. I love the sports analogy of the bench. My favorite bench story of all time is Kurt Warner, who just recently was inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. And here's a guy that was on his last chance by his own admission in his Hall of Fame speech. And he's on the bench, he's been practicing, he's been developing, he gets an opportunity where there's a horrific injury, but he has to go in the game and try to save the game. He doesn't just save the game, he leads them to a Super Bowl championship. Right. That's what you're doing. That's what you've just described. You've got to put some people in there, give them some game time experience, not just practice time, but give them some game right. time experience. I love that. That is so rich because we know this in corporate America, in small business, there are going to be injuries. There, you know, they may look like someone moving away or, or, or maybe a baby comes along uh, or right. some other kind of crisis where they just say, I'm out. I've got another opportunity. And if you don't have somebody on the bench that can step in, it can really hurt you. Sure. And let me put one little twist on that. Certainly, we want leaders ready in those catastrophic, unpredictable circumstances. Absolutely. I'm saying if you're creating a leadership culture, you're more proactive. Yes. You're more strategic. You're trying to do this when you don't have a tragedy, right. when you don't have a catastrophe so that you will be ready in the event you do. Mm. But, you know, sometimes you need more leaders, not because, because of a tragedy. You need more leaders because of growth. You That's need right. more leaders because of opportunity. All right. So, Mark, we've got define leadership, teach leadership, practice leadership. What's next? Well, this is the most challenging, this next piece of the, the puzzle. And that is you have to measure it. You've got to measure leadership. And I get so many questions. P people understand immediately how hard this is. So I got a couple of quick tips for you. Number one, quit looking for a perfect metric. Mm, I, I, I spent way too much time trying to look for a perfect metric. You're looking for indicators. Some would call them health indicators of your leadership culture, but just you're not looking for a perfect metric. Second, you're not looking for a single metric. I spent a lot of time and our team spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, it may not be perfect, but what's the single metric? It's probably a family of measures. I would encourage organizations to create a leadership scorecard with multiple measures. And then third, I would say, I believe it should be dynamic over time. Let me give you a quick example. If you have a newly minted leadership point of view, then on your scorecard, you will probably want to track how many leaders within our organization have been trained on our leadership point of view. And in the beginning, that number will be zero and then it will climb. And at some point, it'll be 100 percent. At the same time, you've built that training into your process for new leaders. So there's no need for that to stay on your scorecard indefinitely. So I think it needs to be a dynamic scorecard. 
And uh, I think those those tips may help you. Mm. Uh, but it, it's critical. It's critical to measure your progress and know what's working, what's not, where are your gaps. And then one more thing, as far as the outcome, some people go, yeah, but what are the outcome measures? I mean, mm-hmm. you can measure how many people go through training, but yeah, does that really matter? Well, it, it's probably a prerequisite to outcome measures, but any number of ways you can do that. Um, one I like is what Federal Express has done. They've created a leadership index. They've taken, the last time I checked, they had pulled seven questions off of their corporate engagement survey and created an index. So they cheated. They have one, one number, but it's really got seven numbers rolled up into it. And they picked things that are the direct reflection of leadership behavior. As an example, uh, an employee would be asked to rate their agreement with the statement, I fully understand the mission and vision of the organization. Well, if somebody says no, that's a reflection on their leader. And so they create an index so that they can uh, help their leaders grow on those critical behaviors. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, uh, you can measure how many leaders are ready now for their next opportunity. We do an annual leadership talent review and many other organizations do this as well. And one of the things we're trying to judge is someone's readiness Mm. for their next opportunity. You can put that on your scorecard and say, this year we have 6% of our leaders that are ready for their next opportunity. What's the goal? And there are any number of ways. Organizations all over the planet have figured out how to measure the health of their leadership culture, but nothing improves without measurement. And so that is a critical step of this bigger play to create a leadership culture. All right. This is a master class, folks, in making leaders. All right. So we're going to review and finish with this last step. You've got to define leadership. You've got to teach leadership. You've got to practice leadership. You've got to measure leadership. What's next, Mark? Well, it's the most personal step in the journey, and that is you have to model it. Yes. Existing leaders have to be in the game trying to live out the leadership definition that you've articulated. Now, at the highest level, I'll give you a really simple example. Maybe this is too too simple, but I, I like simple. If your organization says we are advocates and proponents and practitioners of servant leadership. And you have existing leaders that go, not me, that's not, that's not my jam. I'm, it's a command and control, my way, the highway. You know, you're here to serve me, I'm not here to serve you. Any, any number of ways, either overtly or, or uh, subconsciously, if that's the behavior that is tolerated among existing leaders, you've got no shot of creating a leadership culture. Here's the deal. People always watch the leader, whether we want them to or not. And they're trying to figure out, are you trustworthy? And and by the way, they're also trying to figure out what's important to you because most people want to please their leader. But you have to model it. And again, they don't expect perfection. People do not expect perfection, but they they certainly expect effort from their leaders. Mm. Mark has uh, really thought through this. The leadership at Chick-fil-A has thought through this, and they've modeled it. Everything you've just heard actually works. That's what's fun about this. 